Well, we started this series, if you have your Bibles, phones, or tablets, in James chapter 1, and, and we started out last week talking about the fact that everybody has problems. Okay? Problems are a part of life. The word that James uses there is trials, but it can be pain, it can be problems. We talked about it last week. We all respond different to our problems. For some of us, when we encounter problems, we go through the yearn stage. We want to go back to the past. For others, we talked about the churn stage where we get angry at God, at others, at ourselves. We talked about the burn stage. We talked about we talked about the, the final stage that we hope we can all get to is not yearning, burning, or churning, but actually learning. Everybody say learning. And so that's what we talked about last week is that in our pain we want to learn. And the way we learn in our pain is we have the proper perspective. Everybody say perspective. So last week I talked about three perspectives that we need to have if we want to learn in the middle of your pain. So if you're going through problems this morning or if you know somebody going through problems, really would encourage you to go watch. You can go to YouTube, Life, Light, what is it? What is our channel? Lighthouse Dallas? Lighthouse Dallas is our YouTube channel, and you can watch the sermons there and the teaching and get that. Uh, so the whole idea of perspective. Well, this week, we're still in James chapter 1, and we're in verse 2, and we move from perspective to perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. Now, perseverance is not a four-letter word, even though sometimes we think it is, right? Let's look at our text this morning, James chapter 1, verse 2. James tells us, Consider it pure what? Joy. joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face what? Trials. That's problems. That's pain. That's difficulties, disappointments, abuse, other people not treating you good. When you have those things in your life, James says, count it joy. And then he tells us why we count it joy. Because you know. See, this is the perspective we talked about last week. You know that the testing of your faith produces what? Oh, so there's a reason for my problems. God's trying to produce perseverance in my life. And the reason I need perseverance, look what the next verse says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be Mature and complete, not lacking anything. I like one translation that says, let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect. How many of you want to be perfect? Just anybody with their hands up, just look at them and say, you got a long way to go. Okay, so. <laughs> right? Just, just a news flash for us all. On this side of glory, we're not going to get perfect. And it's okay. It's not where I am, it's where I'm headed to. That was pretty good, thank you. We're heading there. God's not expecting us perfection, but God's saying, hey, if you'll let your perseverance work. So on your outlines this morning, on these cards that you now have in your hands, here we go. Our big thought of the day is this. Perseverance is my path to perfection. Perseverance is my path to perfection. Now, I, I'm going to admit to you up front this is a lifelong experience trying to get there you don't all of a sudden wake up one morning and go praise god i now have perseverance you also need to know that there is a big difference between patience and perseverance patience is a gift of the holy spirit it's one of the fruit of the holy spirit did you know that galatians chapter 5 says the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience why does god give us patience because we have to live with people All the married people say, yeah. But there's a big difference between patience and perseverance. You see, when the Bible talks about patience, the definition of patience is actually this idea of passive endurance. So if the gift of patience helps me to endure you and you to endure me, patiently, enduring the difficulties and the problems of life. But when James writes this in James chapter 1 about 
wanting to grow from our problems, he doesn't use the term patience. He uses the term perseverance. Because perseverance is not passive. This is really important. Perseverance is actually active, courageous determination to push forward in spite of your circumstances. Let me repeat that. Perseverance is active, courageous determination to push forward in spite of your circumstances. In spite of what somebody else says, in spite of what somebody else does, in spite of the fact that you blew it, Come on now, we all blow it sometimes, don't we? Come on. In spite of the fact that you tried it and it didn't work, perseverance says, I'm going to push forward in spite of my circumstances. So it's not passive, it's active. So when God calls us to persevere, he's not calling us to sit on the couch, watch Dr. Phil until we get called to our name. How y'all doing? He's saying, no, Darius, you have a part in this process of growing. And it's not passively sitting on the couch eating chocolate cake. As much as chocolate cake is wonderful. You can do it with a Diet Coke and it cancels each other out. <laughs> no. No. Perseverance is actively, courageously, determination to push forward in spite of my circumstances. Now, James is not the only one who writes about this. In the book of Romans chapter 5, Paul, the great theologians of the New Testament, writes a very similar passage in verse 3. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our what? We glory in, uh, can you bring that up for me, guys? Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. You get that? Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Once again, he didn't say suffering produces patience. Suffering produces perseverance, an active, courageous determination to push forward in spite of my circumstances. So this morning, I want to help us develop perseverance. How are we going to do that? Well, I think studying the Word of God and the characters in the Bible actually lend great understanding of how we are to live. The New Testament tells me that the Old Testament was actually written as an example so that you and I today, thousands of years later, can go back and read the stories of people's lives in the Old Testament and we discover that the way they lived their life and the way they persevered is a great example of how we are to do it today in our life. So I'm going to flip all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. In the very first book, in the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 37, we are introduced to a young man who's only 15 years old when the story starts. Do I have any guys in the room 15 years old? Got any 15-year-olds that are willing to admit it? Somebody's pointing. Are you 15? Almost. Almost. Okay, stand up. If you're going to volunteer, you're going to stand up. You're going to be a part of my sermon this morning. There you go. I want everybody to get a visual. This is what a 15-year-old looks like. You may sit down. Now, what would God give to a 15-year-old? In Genesis chapter 37, you know what God gives him? gives him a dream. Not just one dream, but two dreams. Two dreams, and the dreams are rather important because are you the oldest, youngest, or middle child in your family? He's the youngest, oldest? He's the oldest, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your siblings, not for you. Okay? The, our story in Genesis chapter 37 is about a 15-year-old boy who's actually the youngest in his family. Any, any of the youngest in your family? In the room? You're the youngest in your family. How many siblings did you have? Oh, just one. That doesn't count. <laughs> Seven? You had eight siblings in your family and you're the youngest? 
Oh my goodness, and you have Joseph now as a son. Okay. So, that's my story I'm, I'm getting to you, okay? So, this 15-year-old boy has a whole bunch of older brothers. And in his day, the normal process was that the firstborn would always get the larger inheritance and would begin to run the family business. But as a 15-year-old boy, he gets this dream, and in his dream, his dad, his mom, and all of his brothers are bowing down to him. And he gets a second dream, and it's the same thing. And then he calls together his dad and his mom and his brothers, and he says, hey, God gave me a dream. Y'all want to know what it is? Well, they don't care. But he says, I'm going to tell you anyway. So you can imagine how excited they were to hear their little brother tell them, hey, I got this dream. God tells me you are all going to bow down to me. <laughs> just, just, just help you out here a moment, okay? Some dreams God gives you, you need to keep to yourself. Because other people aren't going to be that excited about it. That's what happens in Genesis 37. His brothers aren't excited. His brothers instead get jealous. Now, dad didn't help the jealousy because dad actually gave him this beautiful jacket that was more beautiful than anything any of the other brothers had. It was a coat of many colors. His name was Joseph. He walks around every place he goes. Everybody knows Joseph is the special child. Now, a lot of people say that Joseph had a pride problem. But as we go through the story, I'm going to find, I, I think you're going to find out that no place in the Bible does it tell us that Joseph had a problem with pride. That's something that a lot of people have made up because they like to think that he had pride. I think, you ready for this now? Just play with me a moment here. I think that Joseph was created by God with certain gifts, talents, and abilities with a destiny to be a ruler. And even when he was a boy, his father recognized there was something unique about him. And his, while all of his older brothers were out doing manual labor, his dad kept him in the house to help run the family business because he had a skill set the others didn't have. But here's the deal. Running a little family business of his parents was too small of a platform for the gifts that Joseph had. So God had to move him through some very difficult circumstances to get him where he needed to be to fulfill the dream God had for him. Follow me on this. So guess what happened? His brothers get jealous. So one day he's out in the field visiting his brothers and they grab him, throw him in a pit, take off his robe, tear his robe, sprinkle some blood from one of the animals on the robe to tell his dad, look, here's his robe. Is this his robe? He must have got killed by a wild bird. They lie to his dad, make dad think he's dead, and then they sell him to some slave traders who were headed off to Egypt a thousand miles away. And they don't hear anything else from their brother for 15 years. They figure he's dead. He's out of their life. Dad thinks he's dead. Only the brothers know the truth of what happened. Joseph, who had a dream, living in his dad's house, winds up in a pit, rejected by his own brothers. From the pit, he winds up as a slave in Potiphar's house over in Egypt. And in Potiphar's house, as he begins to grow up and serve as a slave, Potiphar begins to recognize the same thing that dad recognized over here. This kid's got some skills. This kid's got some gifts. And as a slave in Egypt, he is elevated and put in charge of the entire household of Potiphar. He's over everything. And he was probably only 17 or 18 years old at that time. And yet, he is running the show. Everybody else answers to Joseph. And then comes Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife gets to looking at him going, hmm, good-looking dude. And she starts trying to seduce Joseph. Okay? Here's where I believe Joseph didn't have pride. Because let me tell you something. I got a friend who has a Ph.D. in psychology. We were talking about this story the other day, and he says, Darius, I can tell you why he didn't have pride, because people with pride can't resist sexual temptation. 
because people with pride always think they're the exception to the rules. And when Joseph rejected Potiphar's wife's advances, it shows you that he was a humble man. And he says to her, why would I sin against God and against your boss, your husband? Why would I do that? And he fled. What is the what? good little history lesson? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. So when Joseph consistently rejects her advances, she then gets so mad at Joseph, she lies to her husband and, tries to, and tells her husband, that slave you brought in here tried to rape me. He gets lied. How does God respond to our integrity? Sometimes not the way we think. Hello? Wouldn't it have made a great story if the story would have been Joseph rejected Potiphar's wife and he gets to take over the whole house? It's not what happened. From being a slave in Potiphar's house, he gets thrown into prison. How y'all doing? He gets thrown into prison. Why? Because Potiphar's house wasn't big enough for the destiny God had for him. God said, no, you need another step in learning. You know what happens when he gets in the prison? When he gets in the prison, there's a verse of Scripture there that says, and God was with him in the prison. And the guy who's over the entire prison system in Egypt begins to realize that that guy, that Jewish boy, there's something in him that's really awesome. And he elevates a foreigner in the prison and puts him in charge of the prison system in Egypt. This is cool. Hollywood can't write this good stuff. He goes from dad's house to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to the prison. Every place he goes, he keeps rising to the top. Why? Because the giftings of God within your life, if you practice perseverance, will always bring you to the top. And he gets to the top in the prison, and Pharaoh, who is the big guy in charge of everything, has a cupbearer and a baker he gets mad at, and he throws them just so happens into the same prison. Aren't you glad with God there's no coincidences? Because while he's there in prison with the cup baker and the baker, the two of them have dreams. Dreams are a big part of the story of Joseph's life. And the dreams that they have, they don't understand. Joseph interprets their dreams for them. He says, well, one of you, you're going to get killed. The other one, you're going to get restored back to your rightful place. And he tells the cupbearer, when you get restored to your rightful place, remember me. Sure enough, it happens just like Joseph said. The baker gets killed. The cupbearer goes back to the palace. But he forgets Joseph. Hello, how many of you have people that forget you? But he doesn't get mad. He doesn't get angry. He just perseveres. He keeps doing the right thing regardless of what other people are doing. And then there comes a day, years later, when Pharaoh has a dream. And nobody can interpret Pharaoh's dream. And, oh, the cupbearer says, hey, when I was in prison, there was a guy back there who interpreted my dream. And it came true. Maybe he can do it for you. And Pharaoh sends to prison for Joseph. And Joseph comes before Pharaoh and says, Hey, I don't interpret dreams, but God does. God will tell me. And God gives him the interpretation. The interpretation is there's going to be seven years of abundance, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And Pharaoh says, Oh, that's, that's what the dream means, huh? What should I do? And Joseph says, what you should do is you should put together a plan during the seven years of abundance so you store it up so that you have plenty left over in the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh says, that's a good plan. You're going to be in charge of it. And he moves from the prison to the palace as the prime minister of Egypt, number two in charge of the whole land. And during the seven years of abundance he's building warehouses and he's storing up in fact it tells us they get so much in their storage they don't even have enough time to count it all 
And then the famine comes, and everybody starts buying back from the government. And the government gets really rich, and people come from foreign lands trying to buy food because it's the only place to get food. And guess who shows up to buy food? The same guys who threw him in the pit and sold him as a slave. But it's now 15 years later, and they don't recognize their brother the man they are now standing in front of trying to get food who has every right to just have their heads chopped off. Hello. But guess what? Joseph had a different perspective. And his brothers bowed down in front of Joseph. Great story. So what do we learn? Here's four thoughts. You've got the story. Now grab your pens or your pencils and let's Let's take some thoughts of how we can apply this to our life. Here's number one. Number one, we must remember the dream. Everybody say dream. You go to Genesis 37, a 15-year-old boy gets two dreams. Guess what? You know what I think Joseph did during the next 15 years? When he was thrown in the pit, when he was a slave in Potiphar's house, when he was in the prison, I think Joseph had some quiet times where in his mind he replayed the dream God gave him as a 15 year old I'm 68 years old when I was a young teenage boy God gave me some dreams when I was in my mid 20s I remember one night God gave me a dream I remember the dream was, I, I felt God say, Darius, what do you want life to be like in five years? I remember in my dream when, when I heard God say that to me, I thought to myself, man, my, it was at a very low point in my life. And I remember thinking to myself, I thought, five years, God, I'm just trying to make it five days. You ever been there? If I can just make it to the end of the week, God, be happy. God says, what do you want life to be like in five years? But the dearest in my dream, I'm watching myself talk to God in my dream, and the dearest in my dream said, I want to get married, I want to pastor a church, and I want to, and five things right off the bat I told God I wanted to do. And I thought, well, that was weird, must have had bad pizza. (laughs) Next night I had the same dream. I'm kind of slow. But after the third night having the same dream, I thought, you know, I probably should write that down. So when I went to bed the third night, I actually put a pen and a piece of paper beside on my nightstand. And when I had the dream, I woke up, turned on my light, and I wrote it down. I put a date on it. I wrote down my dream. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a son. I'm going to pastor a church and some other things that were very personal. Put the date on it. I put a, in my dream, God gave me a verse from Jeremiah 33. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you plans to give you a hope in the future I wrote that at the bottom of my little piece of paper for days weeks and months I carried that little piece of paper through difficult times I pulled out my little piece of paper and I read these are my dreams this is what life's gonna look like in five years my first date that I ever had with Cindy my, who's now my wife last December we celebrated 40 years of being married yeah. First date, we'd only known each other for a few weeks. I had a long distance relationship. I was coming to town. I asked her, said, I'd like to take you out to dinner. So we had a three hour dinner, which I gave her all of my baggage and figured no niece wasted more money on this if it's not going to work, go anywhere. So <laughs> pulled my little piece of paper out of my pocket and I read Cindy my dreams. Just want you to know this is where I'm going. Do you want to sign up? Nine months later, we were married. And uh, March of 1986, we were elected as pastors, church in Fort Worth, Texas. That night I went home, and as we were going to bed that night, Cindy said, hey, remember those dreams you showed me? still have that little piece of paper I said yeah I keep it in my Bible I went to the back of my Bible pulled out my little piece of paper I read the date 
It had been four years and eight months. Every one of my dreams had happened. We'd gotten married. We had our first child. I was now a pastor of a church. Dreams that looked impossible to man are possible with God. Let me tell you something, friends. You can live without a lot of things, but you can't do much without a dream. I believe the Holy Spirit this morning is going to reignite some dreams that some of you let die. I'm praying that before some of you leave this morning, you're going to open up your heart and say, Holy Spirit, would you give me a dream? Why did you put me here on earth? Joseph was destined by God to be a leader. He had to move to the right place to fulfill the fullness of the abilities that God had given into him. You may be stuck on step two or step three or step four, but guess what, folks? There's a step over here that's going to allow you to fulfill the dreams and visions that God has for your life. Don't give up the dream. And everybody said amen. Well, that was point one. We got three more points to go. I better hurry. Number two, while you're in this process of persevering, you need to practice integrity. Everybody say integrity. Genesis chapter 39 is that part of the story where Joseph is in the house of Potiphar and Joseph, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And Joseph practiced integrity. How was God able to bless him as a slave in the house of Potiphar? Because of his integrity. Now, if integrity is a hard word for you, just think of it in the term of faithfulness. Just being faithful. Being faithful. I've always thought of integrity as integrity is the person you are when nobody's watching. Anybody can act good when the selfies are on. How do you act when nobody's looking? Integrity is being the same person in the dark that you are in the light. The same person by yourself as you are with people. Integrity is acting the same way outside of church as you act inside a church. It wasn't until my freshman year of Bible school at Southwestern, which is now Nelson, that I actually found out that there were people who acted different in church than they did outside of church. One of my most difficult spiritual years of my life was my first semester in Bible school. I was so excited. I had grown up all of my life. My dad pastored little churches, took churches nobody else wanted, planted churches, so we were always small. I was so excited that I would be in this whole environment with all of these wonderful people who believed like I believed, practiced like I practiced, and served God. And I never realized that a part of the students at that Bible school were there because their mother and dad sent them there to straighten them out. And they learned how to play the game of church. In chapel, they could sing and clap their hands at the right time, and they even knew when to shout. But boy, in the dorm rooms, they were heathen. <laughs> At least know what I thought they were. Right, Miriam? She's laughing heavy because she saw some of it too, I bet you. In fact, I'm going to tell you, every student in my church, that, in my our ministry, that ever went to Bible school, whatever the Bible school was, I always sat down and had a talk with them. And I said, hey, let me just tell you something. Not everybody that's there is going to act the way you think you should act. Choose carefully in those first few months who you're going to make as your close friends because there are some that are real and there are some that are fake. Don't hang out with the fake ones. Come on. You know what I began to discover? I began to discover, you know, okay, I, got some, I, want, I want to connect with these people over here that are genuine in their faith. That's what integrity means. You're genuine. You're genuine in your faith. When you connect with the genuine, you become like them. And you know what? Over my four years of being in Bible school, 
a whole bunch of these others over here never made it to graduation. Didn't ever make it. They started falling by the wayside pretty fast. Come on now. Practice integrity. Practice it. Let me give you a verse of scripture. Matt, or no, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. The writer says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, throw off, throw off, throw off, throw off, you get it? Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out from us. You can't run when you're entangled in sin. Oh, wow. That's a whole sermon. My prayer is this morning that not only are some people going to get some new dreams, some in this room this morning, you're going to suddenly have the Holy Spirit hit your heart and say, you know what? You need to throw off some things. You need to get rid of that entanglement. You can get entangled in relationships, to habits, to hurts, to hang-ups of the past. And you're never going to be able to actively, courageously, with determination, push forward. Because you're trapped back here in the sins and the relationships of the past. Everybody say amen so everybody knows it's not you. Okay? We're going to do that. We're going to remember the dream. We're going to practice integrity. Number three, we're going to grow in humility. Everybody say humility. We're going to grow in humility. What do we learn from the life of Joseph? We learn a sense of humility that Joseph had because when he was in the house of Potiphar and his wife kept trying to hit on him, Joseph consistently said no. Only humble people can resist temptation. You know why I know that? Because here's something I know about the human mind. The human brain has the capability to rationalize anything you really want to do. It's scary. In Proverbs, it tells us that our heart is evil. See, we're all born sinners. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short. If you think that you will never fall to sin, you are going to fall. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's the person who is aware that, man, if I step one way that direction, I'm going to fall. So I'm going to build a wall there so I don't go there. Hello? I have certain walls I've built in my relationships. I don't ride in automobiles with females who are not my wife by myself. Don't do it. I told the staff when I came here, I don't counsel with females behind closed doors. I'm on, if, I'm talk, if I'm meeting with a female, even a member of our staff, and we got some amazing women on our staff, I'm always careful. I have glass, I have, it's a public meeting. I don't have private meetings. If, I go, if I'm riding in an automobile and I got to go somewhere, I'm going to grab somebody else to ride with us. There's never going to be just two of us in the car. How you doing out there? Why? Because I'm practicing. I'm growing in humility. I'm understanding. You know? Yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm anointed. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But I was a man before I was ever a pastor. Come on. Are you, I'm going to tell you, the 30-year-old the man who stood in front of Pharaoh was not the same one as the 15-year-old boy who had the dream. He kept growing in his humility. That's why he was able to stand before Pharaoh. Are you growing in your humility? I'm not the same person I used to be, but I'm also not the same person I'm going to be. I'm better today than I was 12 months ago, and I'm going to be better next month than I am today. Hello. Why? Because I'm growing. Everybody say growing. 
we're growing in humility. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 23? Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. Hello. You want to promote yourself? You'll get what you can get. But if you humble yourself, you'll get what God can give you. <laughs> Joseph wasn't running some campaign, Joseph for prime minister. No, Joseph was just faithful where he was, practicing integrity in Potiphar's house, practicing integrity in the prison, being humble where he was. And God says, I can trust that guy. Growing in humility. I got to get to number four. Number four, we're going to have to learn to forgive others. Everybody say forgive. forgive. Forgive others. I love Genesis 50 verse 19. His brothers are panicking when they find out who he is and they realize this is our brother and blah, blah, blah. And then dad dies and they're thinking, oh, this is the moment now we're going to get it. His brothers still didn't understand. But jo look what Joseph said to them in verse 19, Genesis 50. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Oh, that's good. I could preach a little while there. When you don't forgive somebody, you're trying to play God. I was expecting a few amens, so I'm going to give you another chance. When, when, when you don't forgive people, you're trying to play God. That was good. That's not even in my notes. I just got that right there. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This, Joseph had what we talked about last week, perspective. You guys meant it for bad. God meant it for good because God knew I couldn't fulfill my destiny as long as I stayed at home. How y'all doing? Forgiveness, unforgiveness, when we don't forgive people, it's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. When I don't forgive somebody, Jesus even said that if we don't forgive others, then our Heavenly Father can't forgive us. There's something about unforgiveness that literally blocks the grace of God from working in our life. And if you go to Genesis chapter 50, you discover that Joseph didn't wait until his brothers apologized. I think Joseph forgave them when he became a slave in Egypt. I think long before they ever got there, Joseph just put them in the hands of God, said, God, you're going to have to take care of them. They're yours. Some of you this morning have some people in your life, you need to just put them in the hands of God. They say, well, that's just so unfair. Hey, is it fair that God forgave you for all of your garbage? Well, that was good. Okay. Closing verse of scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord. That word wait there can be translated hope in the Lord or trust in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord, those who hope in the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All three of those are actives. It's not passive. This is perseverance. We are actively, courageously determined to push forward. Sometimes we fly. Oh, I love it when life is flying, right? You're just going through life and I'm flying. Sometimes you can't fly, you just run. And there are some times when all you can do is put one foot in front of the other. You're just walking. And it's okay to walk. Because you're still moving forward. That's what my challenge is today. Let's actively, courageously determine to push forward with whatever comes. So with that being said, would you bow your heads with me and let's just whisper a prayer and say, God, what are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, I pray right now for men and women, young men and young ladies that are listening to me today. I pray for those this morning, Lord, that may have given up on life, may have given up on their dreams, 
Lord, I ask that this would be the morning that those dreams would be restored. For those who have never had a dream, God, I pray that this morning you would give them some fresh dreams. And Lord, I, I pray for men, women, young men, and young ladies today who have found themselves entangled with the sins of the past, habits, hurts, hang-ups. God, I pray that today would be the day they'd throw it off. They would discover your forgiveness and your freedom. God, I thank you this morning that you're going to release something new inside of us. You're going to get rid of our pride. You're going to teach us, Lord, how to forgive. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, this is a private moment. What is God saying to you today? I think some of you here this morning, if you would be honest, you would say, Pastor Darius, I I've got some things I need to throw off. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a habit, a hurt, a hang-up. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you go, hey, I'm not going to reach my destiny holding on to this. I need to throw it off. The way we do that is when we realize we can't do it by ourselves. But God did it for us 2,000 years ago when he sent his son Jesus to come to earth to die on the cross of Calvary, to pay the price for our failures so that through his death we could have life. In fact, the Bible says that he took all of my sins, nailed them on the cross so that I could have the gift of his righteousness. You may have walked in here this morning feeling like you're the worst person, the worst sinner that's ever lived, but I don't care today who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. God's grace can make you righteous. So with our heads bowed, if you're here and you would say, Pastor Darius, I need to throw some things off today, and I need Jesus as my Savior, would you just lift up a hand and say, here, Pastor, pray for me this morning, right now. Just lift it up there. Would you do it right now? Come on. Hold them up there. Anybody? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I see up there in the balcony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Four. Anybody else? Five. Thank you. I got, I got some things I need to throw off, Pastor Darius. Thank you. I see that one. Thank you. I see that one. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up with me, please, and everybody look at me right here. Okay? i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come right down here. Now, I know some of you are going to say, like, okay, if I go down there at the front, what are people going to think? You know what they're going to think? They're going to think you want some forgiveness and freedom in your life. Yeah. Say, oh, well, how are they going to treat me? You know what? They're going to treat you with lots of love because this is a church of love. Yeah. And if anybody doesn't treat you with love, let me know about it. I'll help them find another church. Because <laughs> what we need here is a church of people that love people. In my lifetime, I've made many trips down to the front of a building because it's taken a lot of grace and mercy to get me where I am. So I don't do this to try to embarrass anybody or put anybody on the spot. But I know spiritually, something happens when we take a step toward God. Regardless of how many times we have to do it, we step toward God. And when we do it, His grace and His mercy is released in brand new ways. So for those of you who raised your hand a moment ago, and maybe some of you, you didn't, but you know you should have, I'd love to just meet you right down here. And I'd love to have a moment of prayer with you. And then we got some of our prayer partners who would love to just take about 60 seconds and pray with you to help you in that journey and to know how we can do that. So without even singing this song or doing anything, if you're here and you say, Pastor Darius, I mean it. Today's my day. I want to throw off some stuff out of my life would you just step from wherever you are up in the top or stairs down both sides up here right up here come on down give them a big hand as they come would you come on thank you Tina come on man. thank you brother. thank you good morning hi good morning 
You're coming in spite of your brother. You're with her. Good. Thanks for coming. What's your name? Peyton. Peyton? Oh, Peyton. Hi, Peyton. I'm Darius. Good to have you. Thanks for coming. Anyone else want to come? There's several of you that raised your hand. It's, this is not a big deal. We're just going to wait and see what the Lord wants to do. I can't make the choice for you. You got to make it yourself. It's not going to work unless you make the choice. If you'll make the choice, God will do something amazing in your life. Maybe you don't want to walk by yourself. Just ask somebody next to you, say, hey, would you go with me? They'll come. It's an easy moment. Hi. Come on up here, brother. Hi. My name's Darius. What's your name, friend? Armando. Good to have you. Thanks for being here, man. Did you know God put this morning together just for you? Because when he created you, he knew you needed this moment. This moment to be the man God wants you to be. You're going to be a new man. New man. Hi there, sir. I'm Darius. What's your name? Kevin. Nice to have you, man. How old are you? Thirteen. You know, God gives 13-year-olds dreams. You know that? It's a great moment. Thanks for making that choice. You're going to remember this moment. Okay? Anybody else want to join us? It's a pretty neat moment, huh? Y'all want to step right over here? I can step right over here. We're just going to all pray together. Church family, would you join us? We're going to pray a prayer together out loud. If you've never talked to God, this is a good moment to start. You can just repeat after me. And the Bible says something supernatural is going to happen when we do this. Something supernatural. Would y'all pray with me? Let's pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. I confess.